Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zero Week Agora Voices of Innovation discussion. I'm Susan Hockfield, President Emerita at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And it's truly a very special pleasure to have Walter Isaacson with me today to talk about his latest book, The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing, and the Future of the Human Race. Walter hardly needs an introduction. He has had an illustrious career as a journalist, an editor, and an author. He was chairman and CEO of CNN, president of the Aspen Institute, and is now a professor of history at Tulane University. He has written incredibly compelling history through biographies of some of the world's most interesting people, from Leonardo da Vinci to Benjamin Franklin to Steve Jobs and many others. The Codebreaker tells the story of Jennifer Doudna and a great biological race to edit genes with all the promise and perils of manipulating life. Walter, it is wonderful to talk with you today about your latest project. You've written, yet again, a remarkable book. And in it, you tackle the critically important issues surrounding gene engineering with a simply breathtaking intellectual scope. The story you tell is full of fascinating people and mind-opening insights. But even with its huge scope, it reads as a page turner with the pace of a novel. Thank you for giving us such an important book. Hey, so, wow, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's, it is so always fun to talk with you, Walter, and particularly on this topic. In this book, you've brilliantly interwoven a huge number of fascinating and complex topics into a beautiful tapestry. The book follows three major themes through the twists and turns of discovery. There's the science, there are the people, and then there are the pressing and very difficult ethical questions of gene editing using CRISPR that we now have to confront. confront. So um, let's start with the science. Would you take just a few minutes to tell us the central scientific story? What is CRISPR and where did it come from? CRISPR is a wonderful technique that bacteria have been using for more than a billion years to fight off attacks from viruses. And what it is, is that it takes a tiny genetic sampling of the virus that's attacked them, and it weaves it into these clustered repeats, known as CRISPRs, that are inside the DNA of the bacteria. Or to put it more simply, it's an immune system that, attack, that, that uh, is able to fight off each new wave of virus. And by the way, as you can tell, that's something we could use these days. And what Jennifer Doudna and others did is figure out a way to repurpose that so we can edit our own DNA using these wonderful molecules that are sort of guide RNAs to guide a scissors and attack our, our DNA and cut it as we want to for gene editing or for that matter to help use it for vaccines or detection technology or even cures for coronavirus. You know, you describe it so lucidly and so clearly. The science itself is actually pretty complicated, and yet you make it comprehensible. So, you know, this idea of gene edit editing is, has a lot of challenges. And <clears throat> do you think the implications of CRISPR are of as great a magnitude as those posed by how early 20th century physics led us to the possibilities and problems of atomic energy and the atomic bomb? I do think there have been three great innovation revolutions of our time, all based on the fundamental particles we discovered around 1900, which is the atom, the gene, and the bit. The atom, you know, in Einstein's papers in 1905, lead us to things like nuclear weapons and GPS and space travel. The bit, or binary digit, that can encode any information leads us to the digital revolution. And as you've written, by the way, in your wonderful book, The Age of Living Machines, this new revolution is going to be by using molecules as the new microchips. We can reprogram molecules in order to make our own cells into a manufacturing engine. You know, Walter, I love the way you have a, you know, a, set, a set that includes both biology and science, as well as technology. And in your previous books, you've written brilliantly about science, physical sciences and technology, but this is your first book about biology. Was that difficult for you? Well, you know, just like Jennifer Doudna, who's the hero of my book, when I was a young kid here in New Orleans, growing, when I was a young kid growing up in New Orleans, uh, 
My dad left the double helix, Jim Watson's book, on my bed. And I thought it was just like Jennifer Dowden did. It read like a detective story to figure out what are the secrets of life? Why do molecules do what they do? And so when I was a kid, I was always kind of curious about things like, you know, why, you know how, how do molecules actually make living things move and work? And so I've always been interested in biology. I wish I'd gone to MO, MIT and, you know, gotten a degree in biochemistry, but I studied it throughout my uh, college and graduate school life. And I've always wanted to write about biology because there's a real joy, as you know, a real joy in understanding how something works, especially when that something is ourselves. Absolutely, Walter. And, you know, I feel that we're living in a golden age because um, the molecular biology revolution, which started in the late 40s, early 1950s, you know, was curious and interesting, but its impact now is, is absolutely enormous. You know, you, 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 you tell the story. Let's talk about the people a little bit, because the book, just with incredible vibrancy, tells the story of Jennifer Doudna and CRISPR. And uh, that story couldn't be more inspiring, but truth be told, it's pretty complex because it's full of both collaboration, which is one of my great loves, but also fierce competition. So, you know, um, think, yeah, go ahead. I think all of science is that way. And, you know, you read the double helix. There's Watson and Crick, this great collaboration, but competing against Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, also Linus Pauling. And you know what? All of business is that way. All of life is that way. You learn how to cooperate and collaborate, and you also learn at times how to compete. And so my book has four really great characters in it. There's Jennifer Doudna and her collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier, who, and they won the Nobel Prize uh, this past uh, time, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. But you also have somebody you know quite well, Fong Zhang, a delightful Chinese-born, Iowa-raised, MIT, Broad Institute biochemist. And he takes the discovery that Jennifer and Emmanuel do of what are the components of CRISPR, and he races them in order to make it work in human cells. And likewise, George Church, who's at Harvard and was the thesis advi was the advisor to Fong Zhang, he's in that competitive race too. And they all have this enormous respect for each other, but the race gets kind of competitive. And to me, when you tell a story, a detective story, but one that ends up being a great race like that, it's easy to smuggle in large dollops of the science because the science makes it so exciting. So to me, it's a way to make the science digestible but also something you really want to understand because it's all part of this competition they have. First of all, a competition to say, how can we take this thing called CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9, because that's the name of the enzyme that acts as the scissors, and how can we take this and make it an editing tool so we can edit our own genes? But having competed in that, something really great happens about a year ago, which is when coronavirus hits, they realize, well, wow, this can be useful. This can be useful to detect the coronavirus because that's the way bacteria use it. It can be useful of cutting up the coronavirus and even helping us with things like messenger RNA vaccines. And so once again, Jennifer Doudna just in one day reconfigures her lab in Berkeley and a lot of the people in the surrounding Berkeley, Stanford, Bay Area to all work on covid Likewise, Fong Zhang, the Broad Institute, they start doing the same thing. And the cool thing is, even though they're in a race again to help fight coronavirus, this time they don't fight over patents. They put everything into the public domain. They publish papers as soon as they finish discovering something and put it up on these public archives so that they can all cooperate with everybody fighting COVID. So the competition for things like patents and credits and prizes goes by the wayside in this past year. And that's the last quarter of my book when they turn their attention to fighting coronavirus. Yeah, and you tell the story very, very well, Walter. 
You know, one of the things that I think is on many of our minds that the, this transformation in how people work, you know, mm -hmm. formerly fierce competitors become collaborators in ways they had never before under the pressure of delivering uh, solutions to COVID. And, you know, the, one of the questions in mind is, does this set a new standard and a new pattern for work together or not? But, you know, one of the things that's curious to me, Walter, about how you wrote the book is that, you know, with the Nobel Prize in chemistry going to Jennifer and Emmanuel, the world has anointed these two amazing women as the winners or the heroes in a very competitive field. But my guess is that you started your book when the field was in, what shall we say, significant turmoil about who did what when and who would win. So tell us about Jennifer Doudna and how and when you chose her as a central character of this extraordinary story about our ability to edit genes. Well, I picked Jennifer Doudna to be the central character four or five years ago, of course, not knowing that she and her partner, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, would be the ones who won the Nobel Prize. I will admit that this past October, the night or the morning in Stockholm when they're gonna make the announcement, I got up at 4 a.m. and went online to see the streaming announcement live. I thought it was gonna be Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for CRISPR at some point, but usually they wait. I mean, Roger Penrose also won the one for physics uh, that very same week. Uh, and that was just something he discovered 50 years ago. So I didn't think it was going to happen so soon. Uh, but I must admit, it was kind of good for the book that the Nobel Committee anointed them as uh, the winners of the prize. I picked Emmanuel Sharpen. I mean, I picked Jennifer Doudna as my central character, not, as I said, because I knew she'd win the Nobel Prize. So I thought it was possible. But because her life represents all the wonderful, joyful uh, discoveries that lead up to this. She was at Yale the same time you were at Yale. And as you know, this is way before CRISPR was even discovered. This is the 1990s. She's working on the structure of RNA. Now, everybody else in the late 1990s, who are men especially, are all working on DNA, the Human Genome Project, the sequencing of the human genome. And it was quite an alpha male experience, all the people working on that project. But certain people who just didn't feel part of the boys club, and that included a lot of women, started focusing on what turns out to be the far more interesting molecule, which is RNA. Because DNA just sits in your, uh, the nucleus of your cell curating information. The RNA does the real work, taking that information, going to the manufacturing region of the cell and saying, here's what protein to build. So by picking Jennifer Doudna, I could do just what Watson did in the double helix, is start with the structure of this molecule, RNA. And then once she helps discover the structure of RNA, along with uh, you know, people you know very well, Jack Shostak and others, they realize how that RNA could be the key to how life began on this planet. And so that's a pretty big, interesting question. And that led her to CRISPR, because another woman that uh, was at her university, Berkeley, Jillian Banfield, was looking at weird things bacteria had in their DNA and called up Jennifer thinking it might have something to do with RNA. And so that's how Jennifer gets involved in the CRISPR tale. And then finally, she becomes a leader with people you have friends with like David Baltimore on looking at the moral and ethical issues involved. She has a dream right after she helps discover how uh, CRISPR can be a gene editing tool. It's a nightmare, really. And she, somebody wants to hear about it, and she looks at the person, and it turns out to be Adolf Hitler. And so Jennifer becomes the leading person in figuring out what are the policies for this. So it's a long-winded answer to say, I picked Jennifer Doudna because everything from the most basic of science to the role of women in science to CRISPR to gene editing and now to the moral and policy implications through her I could tell what was a really exciting story. It is an amazing story. So I want to, in a minute, turn to these ethical questions because they are, as you've just said, um, daunting. They're complex, they're daunting, and we're going to have to get our hands around that. But can we just pause for a second? Because 
you've written a set of spectacular biographies. <clears throat> All of them are stories about both people and technology. But um, this is the first of your biographies about a woman, isn't it? And of course, as we already talked about, the first that concerns biology. Um, you know, I, I was very um, impressed and delighted by the uh, agile way you handled some of the issues around women in science, which of course have um, once again <clears throat> risen, into, into, risen to the forefront of, of the press and conversations. Yeah, did you, um, what did you learn about uh, women in, as scientists um, that maybe you didn't know when you started out? Women have been left out of the history of technology and the history of science for a long time. One book I wrote, The Innovators, begins with Ada Lovelace and has her as a main character and ends yeah. with Ada Lovelace, who was the first person to do a real computer algorithm and to understand the concept of a general purpose computer. But generally, women have been left out. And when I read as a young child uh, The Double Helix, and then when Jennifer also, when she was in middle school, read The Double Helix by Jim Watson, she noticed uh, Rosalind Franklin, the person who had done the uh, images that lead to uh, Watson and Crick help them discover the structure of DNA. And she thought, wow, that's really cool. Even though Watson is somewhat condescending to Rosalind Franklin and Rosalind Franklin doesn't get the credit she deserves. For Jennifer Doudna, it was like, I didn't realize, she told me, that women could be scientists. And this is when she's in sixth grade. And so she decides she's going to become a scientist. And when she tells her high school counselor that, this is in Hilo, Hawaii, a small town in Hawaii where Jennifer grew up, the school counselor says, no, girls don't become scientists. Well, Jennifer has a stubborn streak. And so she decided that, yes, she would become a scientist. So even though that wasn't the main intention of the book, I got more and more interested both in the role of women in science and some of the obstacles women face in getting into science. Yeah, it's a, you know, it continues to be a vexed issue. Um, you know, uh, it's obviously one that I know quite well. Um, you know, hope <laughs> well, we want to celebrate. Well, I mean, one thing I did want to do, you want to celebrate women in science because partly you need those role models. If Jennifer Dowda had not had Rosalind Franklin as a role model, she may not have become a biochemist. And so I hope this book, among the many things, besides having this exciting science in it, celebrates the role of women, not only Jennifer Doudna, but Emmanuel Charpentier, who shares the Nobel Prize, Jillian Banfield, who was first studying CRISPR at Berkeley. So yes, that's part of the theme of the book. Yeah, that's great. So let's turn um, in the last few minutes to the ethical questions of gene engineering and CRISPR, which obviously loom large in your book, but they loom large for all of us. And when Watson and Crick published The Structure of DNA in 1953, with its implications for self-replication, they pronounced that they had discovered the secret of life. <laughs> now, already at that time, there arose what was then a theoretical concern that we might be able to manipulate that secret of life, to manipulate life, and now we can. And you beautifully and carefully describe the dilemma, should we engineer our genes? And uh, you, you know, set out what I think is a very practical and useful dichotomy, which is, you know, treatment versus enhancement to help think about it. But, you know, tell us more about what you think about it. What's your view after having really dug into all of the possibilities and many of the implications? What are you thinking about today? And, you know, do we, is there any um, chance that we'll be able to kind of corral this new possibility into practices that we can all feel comfortable with. Yeah, when I began this book, I recoiled a bit at the thought of being the first species of life on our planet that could edit its own genes, that could control its own genetic destiny. And uh, I thought it was like, you know, creating Frankenstein's monster or maybe being Prometheus and snatching fire from the gods. And while I was writing the book, it happened. The very first time, 2018, a Chinese scientist and doctor who had been to some of Jennifer Doudna's CRISPR conferences was able to edit the embryos of what turned out to be two twin girls 
in order to change their DNA, not just for the girls, but for the rest of, for all of their descendants. In other words, edit permanently human life. And what he did was he edited out the receptor for uh, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And that caused a whole lot of shock and awe. Jennifer was there when it was the announcement was made, and they're all trying to figure out how to stop this. But the advent of coronavirus made me think, well, maybe there are many good uses for CRISPR, including making us less susceptible to viruses. Certainly, single gene mutations that are clearly bad, such as Huntington's disease, sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis. If we can cure those, and we can now, you know, certainly we should use gene editing for that. And the moral question becomes, do we make gene edits in reproductive cells so that they're inherited, that we can change all of the human species? And that'll get to be very dangerous because it's a slippery slope. Now, of course, all slopes are slippery, so it doesn't mean you have, you have to stop. It just means you have to pause and figure out where's the moral footing. And for me, you know, if people are going to go into a fertility clinic and say, I want my kid to be taller. I want my kid to have more muscle mass. I want my kid to have a certain eye color or skin color or hair color. Maybe I want to enhance their memory or enhance their processing power, even enhance someday their IQ. That gets into a very dangerous thing for two reasons. First of all, it will allow the rich to buy better genes and the inequalities of in our, that exist in our society will then be encoded into making a subspecies, just like in Brave New World or Gattaca. And the second thing is it'll edit out the diversity that makes us such a wondrous species. So I spend a lot of time in the book going and hearing people who are trying to figure out where do you draw the line? How do you do this safely? And for me, as you said, I think if it's clearly to take out a dreaded disease, such as Huntington's or Tay-Sachs, yes, we would want that. And maybe to do things that improve our health. But at a certain point, I think we have to draw the line and saying we can't just use it to enhance our children. We have to have a, some awe of the beauty of nature that's taken three billion years to get our species to where it is. Uh, Walter, you're so wise about this, and I have to tell you how important it is in your book that you dig deeply into the implications and possibilities. You know, one of the things I worry about, and I've seen this, I'm old enough now to have seen many cycles of this, is that we discover something and we think we know the whole story. So we're ready to go with a new intervention, but then it ends up with further study, and sometimes that further study is six months, sometimes it's six years, sometimes it's 16 years. We discover that there are consequences that we didn't know about. Um, there can be off-target effects. There can be, um, I remember early on, I was working on a project with Huntington's disease. We were actually talking, this is in the 80s, talking about the possibility of eliminating the gene. And someone said, well, we don't know what else that gene does. You know, perhaps this aberrant Huntington's gene makes people more empathetic, or perhaps there are other targets. And, and I think that's part of the challenge to us when we decide to make interventions that are um, not reversible. And that's what happens when you edit the germline. You know, of course, we've got an array of medical interventions that change lives and personalities. And I guess you could argue that CRISPR isn't any different from that. But um, I, like you, feel a little queasy. <laughs> we well, it is different. It is different from simply using a drug or an you know, to help cure a disease, because it's permanent in the human, as you said, in the genome, and it would change our species. And yes, there are unintended consequences sometimes. If you take out the um, gene, as you know, to um, for sickle cell anemia, you know, it makes you maybe more susceptible to the West Nile virus or malaria. So we've got to be careful. But the real question is not uh, is it safe and will there be unintended consequences? But what happens if we, dis if we discover it is safe? Then do we want to do it or should we still pause? And uh, there's a wonderful kid in my book, a 17-year-old named David Sanchez, who has sickle cell and they've been treating him for it. And now they're describing how 
edit his genes to make sure his kids don't have sickle cell. He said, well, maybe that should be up to the kid later on. They say, why? He said, well, I hate having sickle cell, but it is who I am, and it's made me empathetic. And so I think we have to all realize it's not just a medical safety issue. It's a moral issue, and that's what I wrestle with in this book. Yeah, and it, it's complicated, but as I said, you've illuminated the issues so beautifully, and it's a real service um, that you've um, explicated, not just the science, which is complicated, yeah. but you know, all the way from the science through the human adventure through to dealing with the, the implications. And of course, you know, uh, for the Asilomar Conference, when we could first edit genes, we agreed as a community to not do certain things. And I don't know how you feel about the possibility of setting out standards like that today. I'm not an You know, um, uh, Jennifer Doudna, right after she has her Hitler nightmare, goes back and reads about that conference you've talked about, the Asilomar conference, which was done early on. It wasn't just, about, it was really about recombinant DNA and creating organisms. And she went to David Baltimore and Paul Berg, who were part of that original Asilomar process, and she started convening groups of her own on this. And the Asilomar process was able to have regulation by scientists themselves, as opposed to having government regulation do it. And it was one of the few times that was successful. I do think it's important to have both governments and scientists all working together to say, what are we going to allow? And what will our standards be on allowing people to, especially allowing people to make inheritable edits when they design their children. And by putting it that way, you can tell I'm a little bit cautious about going too far on something like that. On the other hand, I don't think there should be a ban on it. There shouldn't be a moratorium. We're fighting like crazy to stop the coronavirus. If we can find ways to make humans less susceptible to viruses and it's safe and it doesn't have unintended consequences, I don't want to stop that research. It's going to be up to each one of us to try to figure this out, to think it through. And that's why I wrote this book was because I want all of us, not just the scientists and not just the government regulations, but people like me, not just people like you who have, you know, PhDs and are great scientists, but people like me and my friends to understand both the beauty of this, but also as citizens to be able to understand it well enough that we can all be part of the social decision-making process that will have to happen in the next 10 to 15 years as we figure out, do we want to edit our species? Walter, I cannot think of a better guide in bringing us along the decision tree to make those decisions that are going to have to be made. And um, I want to thank you. I mean, it's always a delight to spend time talking with you, and I could go on for another couple of hours, but I just want to thank you for spending the time to talk with me about this amazing book that you've written, and to thank you for making it obviously exciting to a scientist, but accessible to the people around the world who I believe with you have the risk need to actually understand the dilemma so everyone can participate in the decisions that are going to determine, as you say, the future of the human race. Thank you, Thank Walter. you, Susan. Thank you so much. It's always stimulating to be talking to you. This has been a Hero Week Agora Voices of Innovation for 2021. I want to thank Walter Isaacson for joining me for a conversation about his book, The Codebreaker, Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing, and the Future of the Human Race.